We're totally booked. Rock and roll! Well, I think I'll leave you to your reading. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. Rock and roll out! We are totally booked. Welcome back to Booked on Rock, the podcast for those about to read and rock. I'm Eric Senich. The website, bookedonrock.com. You can subscribe to the email list and get notified of the latest episodes, videos, blogs, and more. Our guest this episode is veteran rock journalist and author Gary Graff. He's here to talk about his brand new book, Alice Cooper at 75. This book covers the life and career of one of the greatest artists in rock history through 75 key releases and events. Graff takes you through the book with the stories going back to Alice's childhood in Detroit and Arizona. He covers his early bands, the Earwigs and the Spiders, all 28 studio albums, Alice's greatest singles, collaborations with other artists, his offstage passions, and charity work. It's all covered here in a book that is packed with amazing photos, both offstage and on. He's got images of rare memorabilia, gig posters, vinyl record sleeves, ticket stubs, advertisements, and a whole lot more, including a gatefold Alice Cooper timeline. Also included in the book, two pull-out posters and an unpublished 8x10 photo of Alice Cooper. It's a beautifully packaged book, comes in a slipcase hardcover format. A link in the show notes page to pick up a copy of this book. It's a must-have for every Alice Cooper fan. Gary's here to talk about the book and the original shock rocker himself, Alice Cooper. A playlist of Alice Cooper on the show notes page. But first, let's talk to Gary Graff. Gary, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. We appreciate it. This book pays homage to Alice Cooper's groundbreaking work going all the way back to 1964 when his first band, The Earwigs, performed their first show. Before we get to all of that, let's go back even further to his childhood years. Although he left Detroit early in his life, Detroit never left him. He's proud to say that that is his hometown. He was born Vincent Damon is it pronounced Fernier? Fernier. Okay. On it's February, very, very French. Yeah. On February 4th, 1948. Can you talk about those early years? He loved the Detroit Tigers, right? He, I mean, yeah, that's that's the great thing about Alice here in Detroit is he, like you said, you ask him where he's from. He says Detroit. He's been in Arizona for a long, long time, but it's, it's Detroit for him. Loves the Tigers, loves the Lions, God help him, uh, loves the Red Wings. The Pistons, really everything about Detroit. And of course, his last album was called Detroit Stories because he was trying to capture a particular spirit of Detroit. And you're right, Detroit never left him when you what you see in Alice is that Detroit Midwestern work ethic and also that Detroit and Midwestern sensibility um, tough but you know what do we call it tough but fair right kang the conqueror you're uh <laughs> tough, tough but fair but no it, it was the kind of thing where you you embrace the dark you know whether it's violence or just you know being downtrodden alice as a, as a character kind of embraces that and yet turns it into entertainment gives it a, gives it a very interesting spin to where you you accept it as the act. And that's very much a part of what Detroit is. You know, it's a tough city. It's a city with a big chip on its shoulder. But at the same time, Detroit uses it to great comic and entertainment effect. And I think you really see that in a lot of Alice's character when he talks about the early days, you know, a family, a family of characters, you know, his uncles who had pool halls and, you know, played with uh you know, used to play pool with fats. And, yeah, I thought you know, that was fascinating. Yeah. And, yeah, sharp dressing guys. And, you know, there were, it sounds like there were a lot of zoot suits in Alice Cooper's family and a lot of flashy cars. So that, it's very much, uh, it's, it, I think that stayed, that has stayed a part of his character and it's been ground zero and then integrated it into all the other life experiences he had that turned Vincent Fernier into Alice Cooper. One thing I didn't know, he moved out of Detroit because of his chronic asthma. Yeah, health 10 issues. 10 years old. Yeah, yeah. it's not, not a city to be a, a kid in if you had trouble breathing. Yeah, kept him inside all the time. So when he's 10, the family first moves to L.A., then Phoenix, Arizona in 1961. He meets the first of his future Alice Cooper band bandmates while in Phoenix. A kindred spirit, you write. Dennis Dunaway, who became Alice's bassist. They had a lot in common, including a love of the Beatles, 
And this leads to Alice's very first band. Can you talk about that first gig they perform and how that develops into the Earwigs and soon after the Spiders? They became a local favorite pretty fast from what you were very, very fast. But so it's interesting. We use the band, in, the name band in quotation marks when it comes to uh, that first gig. It was a high school letterman show. And they were miming, basically, two Beatles and Stones hits. But they, you know, they they had a couple of real musicians involved with them, including uh, Glenn Buxton, who became the lead guitar player and and quickly decided they wanted to be a band. You know, these were it's interesting. There was a dichotomy. They were jocks. They were on the cross country team and, and Letterman, you know, really good, really good athletes. At the same time, they were freaks who liked their rock and roll and were also studying, uh, you know, Salvador Dali and all sorts of, of experimental art. So, you know, that's the kind of combustion you had. And they did when they just, they decided they wanted to be a band. So they put the earwigs together. They later became the spiders. And it was, it was almost like when you watch uh, the movie, that thing you do, you know, in Erie PA, there weren't a lot of rock bands, right. In this fictional account. So all of a sudden the O'Neaters or the wonders could become the big local band. That's pretty much what happened with uh, the Spiders. Earwigs and, is interesting. Where did they come up with earwigs? I, I can't recall if it's in the book. It's no. It was just. It was kind of a name they picked, and I think it was a little bit to do with um, uh, earworms. You yeah, know, the yeah. idea that, that, that you can have an earworms. So they they somehow twisted it. Into, into, <laughs> hey, you got into, the Beatles, the Turtles, and the the earwigs. The earwigs. <laughs> and what was interesting though about uh, when they became the Spiders was they were open, you know, not only were they playing at local clubs, but they would open for national bands as they were coming through. And this is in the early days of rock and roll touring. And one of my favorite story is they were huge Yardbirds fans. I mean, even more so than the Beatles, the early Alice Cooper group came from the Yardbirds and the Stones and the Animals, you know, more rock than pop. But I guess the Spiders opened for the Yardbirds, but they were playing a lot of Yardbird songs in their <laughs> sets so they basically played the yardbird set and <laughs> people hilarious. at least according to alice's account people were leaving after <laughs> the spiders because they'd already heard the songs oh. and he, he said the yard you know he said some of the yardbirds would remind him of that yeah. for, for for years to come that's great and there's a picture of the spider's very first single don't blow your mind that is mm -hmm. in the book one of many great finds throughout Alice's career in this book, among the 75 standout stories of Alice's career, included in the book you title An Assembly of Bad Fellows. The classic lineup of the Alice Cooper band solidifies in 1967 while they're in Los Angeles. Along with Alice on lead vocals, you got Dennis on bass, Glenn Buxton, as you mentioned, on lead guitar, Michael Bruce on rhythm guitar and keyboards, and then you have Neil Smith on drums. They start as the Earwigs, then the Spiders, then the Naz, which I didn't realize that. They had to change it. Right, because it's Todd uh, Rundgren's band. Right, right. And there's the Yardbirds connection, right? Because the song, the Naz are right. blue. That's where they got blue, it. that was the Yard. That's where, that's where the the Alice Naz got it. Todd's was from was from something else entirely and it's funny i just uh, i was speaking with todd this past fall and i asked him if there were you know if alice ever came up to him to thank him for uh for having the name the naz that forced them into into a band name alice cooper that would be that would generate a lot more attention than the naz ever would and he said he did he, did, <laughs> he said yeah. they have had they have had that discussion so a new name is needed can you talk about how vincent fernier comes up with the name Alice Cooper and the myth behind it. There's the Ouija board. There's a lot of myth. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Many. And that's that's what we go through in the book. So the the great myths involve everything from a band manager coming up with the name to the the group playing a and within a Ouija Ouija board and the spirit of Alice Cooper being channeled. And that's the, something they the Ouija board. Yeah. they talked and said they that that was a story. They, right? they spread yeah. that story yeah. for a little while, but it was it just came, you know, really from Alice's imagination and this. You know, they were to, they were just batting around different ideas, and the way he tells it is, you know, Alice Cooper kind of popped out, and he thought it was a little bit of a, uh, you know, Betty Davis in there, and uh, now I'm blanking on the the movie name. Uh, oh she, well yeah that's the, uh, the uh, uh yeah. Be betty Every davis and joan crawford movie right yeah everybody yeah. buy the book and figure you'll, you'll get this <laughs> exactly. we'll keep that as the, the teaser but it, it had that he felt like it had that feel yeah um virginia wolf you know 
And it had, it had that kind of feel. It was an interesting name. And they pretty quickly saw that it would generate attention like, okay, who's an Alice Cooper? What's an Alice Cooper? There aren't any, okay, their hair's long, but there aren't any women in this band. What, what's going on? And they figured out that that would be an attention getter. And it was a band name first. He was, Vin he was Vincent, the singer of Alice Cooper, of the band Alice Cooper. Only he gradually, be, you know, of course, it's just like everybody calls Ian Anderson Jethro. Oh, yeah. You know, and they were calling uh, David Bryce and Uriah yeah. <laughs> way yeah. back then and Uriah Heap. So that, that's just what happens. And in, in this case, it happened that Alice, Alice, the man became Alice, the, the man. Who influenced Alice? Was he aware of Arthur Brown at that time? I don't think so. No. You know, he, no, they became aware of it later. You know, Arthur, I guess we could call was the first shock rocker. Right. But although, you know, Screaming Jay Hawkins might fit into yep. that, that mold too, but nobody did it like these guys. But yeah, Alice um, was a visionary. Right. And they were really, you know, and, and what they were doing in Los Angeles, you know, in the early days as the Spiders, then the Naz, and then Alice Cooper. I mean, that predated David Bowie even. And this was this was really the first theatrical. I'm sure there's some band in Tulsa who can say, oh, listen, in 1966, we were doing this or that or the other thing, whatever. Alice was you the know. guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, Alice was the band. That's the thing, you know, I frequently I find myself frequently talking about is that band is what created what we now know as Alice Cooper. OK, and so they, they're collaboratively. They very much. I mean, like I say, Alice and Dennis Dunaway were surrealists. Okay. fans loved all those people uh they they were really the driving forces but definitely uh neil michael and glenn were part of it and when they threw around ideas like let's dress like this or let's use this stage trot prop or let's kind of let's cut vince's head off you know these were these were collective decisions and the and the result of a back and forth between the yeah. five of them the booked on rock podcast will return after this now, how does Frank Zappa become part of the Alice Cooper story? When and where does he discover him, and what's his first impression of the band? So, yeah, so Frank Zappa, as you know, starting his own record label, and he had, you know, the the Alice Cooper band and whatever you know name they were under at that point became friendly with the members of the GTOs. This was the groupie, or excuse me, Band Aid band that were all friends of Zappa and recording for his label, and a couple of them, said, you know, who were particularly close with the Alice Cooper band. In fact, they helped them make their clothes and help them with their look. They said they were telling Frank Zappa, you got to see these guys. You got to get them on, on your label. And what Frank liked best about Alice Cooper was he didn't get them and nobody, everybody walked out of their shows. So Frank Zappa being Frank Zappa was like, this has got to be great. This has got to be perfect for my label. So, <laughs> so another story, you know, great story about this is Zappa tells him, okay, come over to my house, whatever day at seven, seven in the morning. There's, there's this loud noise in Frank Zappa's house and it's the Alice Cooper band warming up and he goes down in his bathrobe and says, what are you doing? Well, you said seven, 7 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and Fra Frank's an important figure in Alice Cooper history. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, he, he got him started. Put he out got those, him started. Put out those first two albums. Doesn't sound like he taught them a great deal in fact he kind of foisted them off on other people to pr produce but he got them you know he got them into the business and he wound up selling his label to warner brothers records which is what gave warner brothers records alice cooper even though at the time they didn't think they were getting much of a treasure those first two albums did not do well and for if you listen to them uh, for good reason now shep gordon becomes the band's manager and he is Alice's manager to this day, correct? On a handshake deal. deal. Handshake deal. They, well, they what shook was... hands in 1970 at uh, whatever dive hotel the band was yeah. staying. Chef's so they... background, that story is so great. Oh, he's great. What, you know, what is he went, Chef's background? Went to, went to college and, you know, he had all sorts of professional, I don't know that he had aspirations. He tells them that his good Jewish parents were, uh, you know, were the ones who had these aspirations, but winds up getting his degree, goes to LA to be basically be a corrections officer, parole thing. And I think he lasted a day on that job. Just didn't, didn't last and, you know, finds himself at this hotel 
in Los Angeles and, you know, that happened to be ground zero for like Jimi Hendrix and the Doors and the Chambers Brothers and the Make Money Shep was selling pot. And there's no, no <laughs> better way to ingratiate yourself to rock stars than, you know, getting them weed or whatever yeah. else. And it was one of the, cha- so the Chambers Brothers had befriended Alice Cooper. And I think, I forget if it was the Chambers Brothers or Jimi Hendrix. Once again, it's in the book, buy it. Um, yeah, these Chambers Brothers. Yeah, they, they, were the, they were the ones who said to Shep, you know, you're a Jewish guy. You ought to be a manager. And it, it was definitely the Chambers Brothers who also had befriended the Alice Cooper band. And they they made what you, you might call the Shidduch, which is putting the two together and, you know, and meeting up with each other. Shep, too, was intrigued with when he went to go see the band the first time, you know, that they started playing and everybody walked out. And he felt like if there's this visceral and strong of a reaction, there's something here. And they basically they basically learned to be band and manager together. You know, the Alice Cooper knew a little bit about being a band, but, you know, they still learned a lot together. And one of the great decisions that Shep made, you know, which shows how instinctively brilliant he was, was I guess the Alice Cooper band had a $40,000 offer on the table from another label. Zappa offered him $3,000. Shep said, but under the Zappa deal, they kept ownership of their song copyrights. You know, they own they own their songs. Shep was the one who said, we're taking that deal. You know, we're, I'm going to cost you 37000 or maybe it was 25000 whatever. We're going to sign with this guy for a lot less, but we are always going to own our music. Wow. And, what and a, dis- what you, a smart move that was. As you well know, as you see all these uh, artists and bands selling their catalogs for half a billion dollars, you know, for six, seven figures, um, nine figures to, uh, to, the, to everybody who's buying them up now. To own your your music is crucial. But again, he sees something there, like Frank Zappa. He saw outrage. He saw you the know, silver he saw, lining. You wrote. He saw the potential to outrage. Listen, we all, I, most of us became Alice Cooper fans. Most of us of a certain age who were kids in the 70s got into Alice Cooper because everybody else hated him. Our parents hated him. Our older siblings who were hippies hated them. Give them to us. That's our band. You know, so that 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 outrage really worked ultimately worked in their favor and when they finally got the music dialed in you know went through the roof i want to ask you there's 75 notable moments or events in alice cooper history did you have trouble narrowing it down did you have like what are 76 77 (laughs) short short answer is yes long answer is hell yes yeah other other long answer is another word that that we shouldn't say on the air (laughs) um so when i sat down when i first started with the book and sat down and and you know figure okay what am i going to do came up with 150 oh my god yeah so you know walk around the block get some air come back you know knocked it down maybe to 120 and then I figured out how to cheat, you know, how to use some of these chapters so that they would actually deal with more than just the one topic. You know, there is a chapter in there about all of Alice Cooper's guitar players. Right. You know, which could have been each had really, there's so many good ones. They could have had their own entries, you know, chapters that put together his TV shows or his movies. And yeah, so that's cheating a little bit, but. But we still got it's the economizing. We, exactly. We still got the it's efficiency. We uh <laughs> we got the, we got to cover everything we needed to and still fit within the format of the book. Yeah. That was a headbanging, a true headbanging uh, <laughs> yeah. part part of the book. What about the Pink Floyd story? That's that was, one of the 75 most notable moments. I thought it was great that Alice Cooper and Pink Floyd were good buddies back in the you know, late 60s, and that when Pink Floyd came over to America and over to Los Angeles, they wound up living in the same house. What where a Alice, unlikely friendship. It is, but, you know, they were brought over by the woman who was running the Cheetah Club in Los Angeles at the time, and she booked Pink Floyd. And, you know, they wound up, they played poker together. Um, you know, uh, they apparently Pink Floyd dosed uh, the Alice Cooper band one night before they went on stage. Uh, Alice has great stories about, you know, coming down to breakfast and there's Sid Barrett staring at his cornflakes. Shep Gordon uh, managed 
very briefly uh, was the U.S. manager for Pink Floyd until, you know, I mean, it, that's a difficult situation to be somebody's somebody's quasi representative, you know, if you don't have the, the full control. So that didn't last long. But yeah, and again, I was talking to Nick Mason just this past fall when the animals reissue came out. And he told me some fun stories about playing pokers with the guy and he remembered dosing uh, them before, you know, with the brownies before they went on stage one night. So and then they've <laughs> stayed, you know, they, I guess they don't necessarily stay in touch. But when they cross paths, there's still there's still a friendship there because yeah. they they were young and they were up and coming and they were sharing a lot of the same experiences. Yeah, Alice says whenever he runs into a member of Pink Floyd, they bring up the brownie story. Oh, that totally. comes up. That comes up. Alice knew Jim Morrison too, right? Yeah, they because they they were part of that that hotel scene. Jim Morrison lived at the hotel. I never I got the sense they hung out and you know at least you know Morrison especially did some drugs in their company. I never got the sense they were super close friends. I mean, yeah, they, they hung out and they saw each other, you know, certainly in the doors, you know, all the guys in the Alice Cooper band will tell you the doors were one of their early supporters and the doors got what they were trying to do as Alice Cooper. There was a certain theatricality to what Jim Morrison was doing. So they got in and they appreciated it and they encouraged it. So that was another thing where, you know, you're all in the same place at the same time. And eventually you're all going to go your own ways, Jim Morrison to the way a ways. Um, but, but, you know, yeah, there were a lot of connections there. Hendrix, you know, they, they, they hung out with Hendrix. I mean, Shep was selling drugs to all these guys. Well, or Lemmy we, from Motorhead, weed. right? Lemmy oh, yeah. was, was the... Lemmy was, you know, had left Hawkwind and was hanging out in that scene too. Really anybody who was in that Sunset Strip at the time, uh, Laurel Canyon, L.A., you know, late 60s, early 70s rock scene, um, Arthur Lee and Love, you know, yeah. were guys. And, you know, they had certainly met the Buffalo Springfield, Crosby, Stills and Nash. They, you know, that whole that whole crew, even the Jefferson Airplane, Grateful Dead coming down from from the Bay Area. But I think Alice Cooper was too weird for a lot of those people. Yeah. Did Dallas have any stories about Charles Manson? Did he ever cross paths with no. him? No, no. No, no. It seems like you know, I don't want to. Say, it seems like it would fit, but yeah, I think there was awareness of Manson if you were in that rock scene. But they didn't all. Manson gravitated more towards the you know the Dennis Wilson and the Gary the the other folks who he was trying to get them to make him a rock star. Moment number ten in the book is from 1969. Alice Cooper gets some much needed press. To this day, Alice says it's led to one of the first questions he's asked. Still, did you really kill a chicken? What happened on this? Well, he killed it. He killed it accidentally. So I don't know if we, I, he uh, manslaughtered a chicken, I guess is how you'd put it. But they were playing at the, at the Toronto Rock and Roll Revival Festival um, in 69, noted for when John Lennon, I'm sorry, 1970, when John Lennon and, uh, you know, you know, brought an ad hoc band there, Eric Clapton, Alan White from Yes, Klaus Vorman, and Yoko, you know, got the gig the day before, rehearsed on the plane. I'm sorry, it was 1969. And, you know, re rehearsed on the plane, came over and Shep had uh, basically he offered to help the guys. Shep was in Toronto at the time. They were trying to get Jack Richardson to produce Alice Cooper to the Alice Cooper band. Jack, um, Jack Richardson had produced the Guess Who. Shep and Alice and the band really liked the way those records sounded. So Shep was was there trying to do that met these guys putting on the Toronto Festival, offered to help him out in exchange for putting Alice on the bill. Then when Lennon was added to the show, he leveraged to have Alice Cooper go on between the door, after the doors, before Lennon. So nice, you know, nice. He, he, he had some leverage and he used it. So during the show, you know, this chicken walks on stage. And, you know, Alice doesn't really know from chickens. So he picks it up and, you know, after looking at it for a while and using it as a prop, sends it off. He says, figured it would fly. Didn't, didn't know chickens didn't fly. So chicken goes splat into the front where the, interestingly, the people in what we would now call the ADA section in wheelchairs or, you know, mobility limited, they were the ones he says, tore the chicken to bits and, <laughs> And there is video from the festival and you see yeah. people, you see people throwing chicken entrails 
back at the stage to Alice. It was some years later that Shep came clean that he was the one who put the chicken on stage. They were apparently, wherever they were having the festival, I, it must have been near near a farm or a barnyard or somewhere, anywhere, they, there were chickens around. And so Shep, Shep thought it would be interesting to see what would happen if the chicken got on stage. And he he got more out of it than I think he ever could have expected. And Alice very famously talks about how he got a call from Zappa uh, the next day or two days later, Zappa said, did you really kill a chicken on stage? And Alice goes, no. And, and Zappa says, well, don't tell anybody that. It's getting tons of press. You know, this is it. This is your break. And that it really is where, you know, listen, listen let's remember 1969, rock and roll was not what rock and roll became in the society. It was not accepted. It was outlaw stuff. And mainstream media was only too willing to glom onto a story about this, about a rock star murdering an animal. Free publicity, yeah. Uh, totally. And that became, you know, that became a hallmark of Alice Cooper's 70s career, and especially, you know, Chef Gordon. There's a ton of stunts that he pulled that managed to get Alice Cooper greater publicity than, than you could have bought. Gary Graff is here to talk about his brand new book, Alice Cooper at 75, which is due out January 31st, coming out next week. So the book highlights Alice Cooper's 75 career accomplishments, events, and partnerships. The first two Alice Cooper albums, let's get to those. 1969's Pretties for You and 1970's Easy Action. Neither did much. The debut sneaks into the Billboard 200 at 193, and it's gone quickly. You write that the debut is a fascinating failure, and the follow-up easy action is an odd degree of separation between Alice Cooper and Neil Young. Is there anything worth listening to on those two albums? You know, I mean, I, I, I always will steer people to reflected on the first album because that became elected. Um, you, and you hear it. It's slower. It's trippier. But it's, you know, but it's not, not the same song. You know, they're they're very interesting in that, okay, yeah, this was the psychedelic rock scene. And certainly if you are instrumentally inclined listening to what the individual players are doing, particularly Dennis Dunaway, a guy who taught himself to play bass, didn't really know that much about what a bass guitar was when he picked it up. He was just the assigned bass player in the band and created, you know, a style that I would argue is influential as a Jack Bruce in rock and roll you know this he just very very melodic random almost in spots but melodic and somehow fit not only fit all the songs but was a big part in driving all the songs so to hear that on these two albums and just to hear these guys kind of basically throwing anything they could at the wall and seeing what might stick and very little of it really did Enter producer Bob Ezrin. How does the band enter Ezrin's world and what was his first impression of the band? Well, this was like we were talking about was, you know, that Shep had been trying to woo um, Jack Richardson, who wasn't interested. And he basically sent Bob Ezrin to tell Shep no. Bob had just started as kind of a junior partner in Nimbus 9, which was Jack Richardson's studio and production company, and was basically asked to get rid of this guy. But Bob liked them as people, and they managed to convince him to come down to see them in New York at Max's Kansas City, a very hip venue. So Bob does go down, and somehow Bob Ezrin's ears heard within the mess that was Alice Cooper that there was something there. It just needed to be shaped and edited and, you know, really, really produced, which is what he wanted to do so he goes back to toronto interestingly in that first that first time he saw the alice cooper band they were playing the embryonic version of i'm 18. nothing like what it became but bob ezrin's ears heard what that song could become so he goes back to toronto and more or less says to jack richardson yeah you know that band you told me to get rid of i'm producing them I signed him, we're producing them, and, and I, I think we can make hits with them. He produces 71's Love It to Death. He then produces 
Killer, also from 71. 1972, School's Out. 1973's Billion Dollar Babies, which became the band's first number one. School's Out went all the way to number two before that. And the classic songs that are released during this period. I'm 18, Under My Wheels, School's Out, Elected, No More Mr. Nice Guy, Billion Dollar Babies. The career breaker is I'm 18. The version that he saw them play in concert, was it the 18-minute jam that you write about in the book? Right, right. So there was like, it was like a... It was like a jam band type of deal. It was. And, you know, it went and careened all over the place. But somewhere in that song was, dun, dun, da, 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 you know, and Jack heard that and was like, that's the song. We're going to build the song from that. So he came to Detroit. The band had moved to Detroit. They decided that L.A. wasn't they weren't going to make it in L.A. They were correct about that. So they said, we're going to go anywhere that gives us a standing ovation first as we're playing across the country. And that, that was a music festival in Saugatuck, Michigan. Alice being from Detroit was natural. Let's go to Detroit. Let's rent this farm, you know, in Pontiac, Michigan, right next door to a mental asylum where they had their early, which was their test market, their test <laughs> audience, their focus group were the, were the, in, were the residents of this asylum. They could hear a blast. Listen to them click. Yeah. Cause oh. there was a, there was a barn on the farm property and they could hear the, you know, they, and they kept the doors and windows wide open. So Ezrin's coming, you know, back and forth to Detroit to, to song doctor, to sit down with the band and yeah. Snip away. Edit shape you know, find where the riff was, you know, find, find the good, the good ideas within, within what the band was doing. And, you know, to their credit, the musicians, especially um, Alice, Mike Bruce, you know, Dennis, they, they got with the program pretty quick and, you know, they bristled a little bit, um, especially some of the instrumentalists, you know, they bristled about this kind of external control over them. But listen, once you have a hit single, you decide I can, I can live with that. You know, it's a great song. Well, you know, one of the things that that often gets eclipsed in the Alice Cooper mystique, you know, which of the stage show and of all the uh, macabre things that he does is that he, the band and Alice Cooper, the man, have right up to present day made great music, wrote wrote good and great songs, made great sounding records. And that's why they're still around. It's not, and that's why he's still around. It's not just because he hacks up baby dolls and gets his head chopped off. It's because he has great songs to go with it. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. School's out. Oh, yeah. There's another one that taps yeah. into the, the youth culture like I'm 18. And as you write, it's an anthem for the ages. The band's first top 10, a collaborative effort by the band and Ezrin, who uses an idea he'd revisit on Pink Floyd's The Wall, which is interesting. Can you talk about how the song comes to life, starting with that riff and then the lyrics, which are inspired by a series of movies right back in the 40s and 50s? Yeah, you know, yeah, the um, I, I guess you call them jailbreak movies almost, but this idea that of breaking out. And, you know, it occurred to Alice, what's the ultimate breaking out? that last day of school when you're when you're waiting for the school bell there's a song there's a song there and he created the you know this idea yeah school's out let's let's do that it'll and they re, they recognized at the time at least where it would fit that certainly every may or june this is a song that, that could be played yeah like a christmas song exactly <laughs> it, it has it has its season um you know and it, listen it was even used in a staples ad right yeah. Um, recently where, you know, a little girl shopping with mom, clearly not happy about going to school and school's out playing in the background. And they, they come down one aisle and there's Alice doing some shopping. And the girl looks at him and says, I thought you said school's out forever. And he says, no, it's school's out for summer. Uh, there I actually is. It actually is school's out forever on one of the lines. So yeah. the girl, the girl wasn't wrong. Did the riff come first? Was that? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. The riff, the riff was there first. And the riff I believe was even there around killer time they, they just didn't they had to make killer very quickly because love it to death you know and i'm 18 was doing so well and those those were the days when bands were making two albums a year or at least releasing two albums a year so warner's was cracking the whip and saying you know get back in there get another record and you know we want we want the next single 
before I'm a the first single from the next record before I'm 18s off the charts. Now the lyrics, now the Bowery Boys movies, right? Isn't that the that was some of them? Yeah, there, there some was, of the inspiration to the lyrics, right? The right, fifties films. Yeah, the Bowery Boys, Jimmy C- James Cagney uh, films. Right. You know, anything that had that. First of all, there are a lot of influences at work from Alice Cooper, from the Busley Berkeley world and the MGM music, you know, musicals. And, you know, they he they and he in particular did write from this cinematic perspective, you know, wanting to make almost mini musicals within the songs. There are a lot of songs that don't get played within the canon that are real showmanship songs. They could be in in a film musical. So a lot of that. So what you, I think what you hear in schools out really is a an amalgam of all these influences on Alice, you know, the lyrically, all these influences on Alice and creating a scenario, creating a story, uh, but based in this idea of the jailbreak or let's break out of somewhere. The Pink Floyd connection is when you get the children singing no more. Papers, no more pencils. No, no, no more, more pencils. No more. Yeah, right, right. No more teeth. Yeah, and, and, and then you get that in Pink Floyd's "The Wall," which uh, yeah. would be uh, it was a, another brick in the wall. Another brick in the wall, part two. Yeah, and yeah. that's you know Bob Ezrin was producing that minefield of an album, um, and they and you know he just he just said what well, he suggested to the band let's let's get some kids from the the choir kids from the school down the road. Let's do like we did in schools out here. Let's have, it's a song about, it's basically a song about hating school and kids being mistreated in school. Let's have kids sing some of the choruses on it. And, you know, it worked like a charm. Billion Dollar Babies released 50 years ago next month, right? It was February. February, Yeah, yeah, yeah. February of 73. Elected, No More Mr. Nice Guy, and the title track, the highest charting album. Where does the title come from, Billion Dollar Babies? That's what they felt they were. They kind of, you know, that kid just came from group give and take and discussion and media references, you know, and somewhere along the line, just, you know, much like the Alice Cooper name popped out. Yeah, we're, you know, and, you know, a, a, a tour manager, you know, calling them babies and yeah, we're babies. We're billion dollar babies. Ezrin doesn't return for the next album, 1973's mm-hmm. Muscle of Love. It would also be the last album recorded by the classic Alice Cooper band lineup. Why wasn't Ezrin part of it? And what led to the end of that lineup? You say there's far more to the story than is told. Yeah, it's basically where things came off the rails, where the lingering resentment the other musicians had about Alice Cooper, the band, really becoming Alice Cooper, the man and Alice becoming the star of the show and them feeling like they were getting short shrift, not just in the media, but they felt like their ideas weren't being taken as seriously as a group and that everything had become about this image that was created and the music and the songs had to serve this image, this stage show, and not necessarily be the good rock and roll songs they wanted them to be. This is true of Michael Bruce in particular, but all of the members shared that to some degree. So when it came time for Muscle of Love, the other guys in the band were putting their foot, their feet down and saying, we want it to run differently. We want this to be a more democratic process. We want it. We want to have more input. Um, This is where particularly Michael Bruce, who had been chafing under Bob Ezrin's thumb, if you will, you know, decided he wasn't going to take it anymore. You know, no more, no more Ezrin, no more books. And he, you know, and, and so Ezrin sees the writing on the wall and says, you know what, I don't want to deal with this. I've made four major hit albums for these guys. I don't need to put up with this crap. And, you know, ironically, Jack Richardson, the guy who originally told Bob Ezrin to get rid of this band, uh, was the guy who stepped in to produce it. It's and amazing, it's, though, how many bands that happens to it's it's rare when it doesn't yeah like yeah. u2 or well, right u2 has you know. so the pearl jam yeah pearl jam, um, green day i think yeah you know, sound garden sound garden although chris cornell never necessarily became the you know the star of the the face of the band to the magnitude alice cooper yeah. did but look, um, look at kiss what happens with kiss look at it yeah it's just and for yeah. alice you can't really blame him it's just he's caught up Not in that right. whole whirlwind of 
of and he, fame. And, and he's young and he doesn't, you know, he's feeling the pressure. He's trying to navigate his life as a superstar. And so he doesn't necessarily know how to deal with the other guys and how to make it right. And, you know, you, you did have management, you know, and record company who did not want to hear from this extra, you know, extra input. We, that what we're doing is working, you know, do not rock the boat, stay with, go with the program and be happy. You're a famous, you're in a famous rock band. You are not as famous a rock musician as Alice Cooper, the man, but you're a famous rock musician. You're getting to make albums. You're getting the tour. You know, that's, that was the company line, you know, just, just lay off. So, so the, you know, the long and short of it was they wisely decided to take a bit of a break, you know, which a lot, which most bands don't know how to do. And certainly in 1973, 74, no band, no band knew how to do that. And, you know, they were all afraid that if they went away, someone would take their place. So Michael Bruce goes off to make a solo album and then they, and wants to work on it. But when Shep and Alice are ready to get back to work, the other guys aren't available. So it's, and they basically, you know, at least according to, according to most accounts, they were given more or less given an ultimatum that, and told, we're going to go make a, a new album. If you're not there, we're still going to make this new album. So that became Welcome to My Nightmare. Right, yeah, which is technically Alice's first solo project. Correct. And and very different in a lot of ways in that it was for a different record company because the deal with Warner Brothers allowed Alice to make a sound, basically a soundtrack album for another label. So in order to take advantage of that and make more money uh, for that album, they created the Welcome to My Nightmare TV special, film, you know, musical presentation, and then so that they could release Welcome to My Nightmare with Atlantic Records. And it goes number five on Billboard, and yeah. it's platinum, so things are still good for Alice. By the mid-'70s, he's part of pop culture. He appeared on The Muppets in November of the 78. Muppets, yeah. The Snoop Sisters, Hollywood Squares. Yeah, but, but um, here's, here's though, it's now, and I remember Alice talking about this, he gets lost in the character, kind of right. loses who, himself. He forgets right. who he really is. And his drinking and his eventual use of cocaine becomes a problem, and he, he just can't ignore it anymore. How bad did things get with the drinking and cocaine, and what led to him finally deciding to get help? Because he, he says he doesn't even remember recording some records. Right. And, and you have a photo in the book from 1982 that is just it's hard yeah, to the, look at he the, kabuki, so the kabuki photo well that's so when he thin. appeared on uh, the tom snyder show right and people were you know everybody that was the hu a huge alarm bell and he nearly died you know it was that simple he nearly died he went through two rehabs um he went to you know one on the east coast that Shep and uh, and Cheryl, Alice's wife, right, he um, Cheryl along the way, yeah, right. She she was a dancer on the on the Welcome to My Nightmare tour, and uh, they you know they got him into you know at this at this point it was for alcohol, and that rehab took for a minute. It even gave him an album from the inside about his experiences at that, and that was an asylum. At the time, there weren't Betty Ford clinics or anything. It was an asylum near in upstate New York, near where Chef Gordon had really? a house. And then, you know, the second one was uh, three years later when he was, you know, he had gotten addicted to cocaine and he, well, he, he'd relapsed into alcohol, got addicted to cocaine again. And Cheryl just left him. She went to, she went to go back to her parents for a while, Shep Gordon told Alice, I'm not going to manage your career where you're killing yourself. And so Alice was left. It's a very dramatic story that he tells quite well, but he was left at home alone. And, you know, he had put his clothing over the over the windows, keep the light out, you know, wasn't eating or, you know, obviously not taking care of himself. And one day he just looked at himself in the mirror. And he had picked up this, he calls it a giant rock of you know, crack, crack rock. And he, whatever happened, flushed it down the toilet, went home to Phoenix, got into rehab there with his parents, helping him out. And 
had a successful rehab that stuck to this day. To this day, um, yeah. He, you know, he re-embraced a very important part of the story. He re-embraced his spirituality. You know, he's the son of a pastor, grandson of a pastor. Cheryl, his wife, is also the daughter of a pastor. Uh, he re-embraced uh, his spirituality and Christianity. That helped him realize that there was Alice Cooper, the character, and Alice Cooper, the man, and finally draw some separation right. and be able to say, okay, this is Alice Cooper doesn't exist outside of the stage. When I walk on that stage, Alice Cooper exists. When I walk off it, Alice ceases to exist and I become Alice, but not that Alice. Yeah. He knew how to turn that switch off. You did mention in the book, you got into the the drinking at one point. It was something where he woke up, drank, and then you had the whole thing that we could find it, but I don't know, maybe yeah, no, he drank, you know, he was, what? he was, you know, he, his breakfast, like, you know, Keith Richards calls his break, his, his, uh, ham, his bacon and eggs is rebel yell and Jack Daniels. Alice's breakfast was Budweiser. Budweiser. Yeah. And then later in the day, it would be uh, Seagram's V up. And he, didn't he have something under, he had him under his bed. So yeah, he, he had him by the down. bed. So when he woke up, he could, uh, you know, apparently was okay with warm beer which tells you how far gone he was. And they also kept a bucket there for when he had to throw up. And yeah. this was this was back when he was very functional. This was on like the Billion Dollar Babies tour. Yeah, it's it's a great story that the, the come back. And like you say, to this day, I mean, he never, never went back. And, and the book has so many interesting chapters that get into Alice's career and life on stage and off, like his meeting with Elvis Presley, oh, moment, number 22 in the book. Elvis's first comic quote, you're the cat with a sneak, right? Right. Yep. You got it. You can just hear him <laughs> saying that. And then Elvis, and then Elvis, you know, pulling a gun and then saying to Elvis, try to take it from me. Yeah. And Alice is like, no, your people are going to shoot me. Yeah. Or yeah. you might shoot me. And, you know, Alice is very quickly on the floor because, you know, Elvis was a kung fu guy. Yeah. And Elvis time. wanted and, to meet him. Elvis was uh, the yeah. one who said, Alice, El Elvis, Elvis, nice. Elvis was very aware of everything else that was going on in pop music as cloistered as he was he knew who alice cooper was he knew who led zeppelin was he knew who was on the charts and who was doing business and he did see he did seek out these people so yeah no alice was one of the guys he uh he wanted to meet they met in vegas um yeah it's a fun story you got another one chapter 21 or number 21 event <laughs> or moment in the book leave it to eddie so that refers to Eddie Haskell um, from Leave It to Beaver. He was the villain in Leave It to Beaver, who was played by Ken Osmond, who I guess rumor rumor went around like how, you know, um, you know, a lot of people thought the kid who was on Boy Meets World became Marilyn Manson. Right. Um, so this was a case where people thought Ken Osmond was Alice Cooper. He grew up to become Alice Cooper. And it followed him all the way all the way through his you know through the you know into the 70s when he was of all things a police officer he had left acting to become a police officer and he was hearing about how he was alice cooper and hilarious yeah just too funny and you know alice being the pop culture nerd that he is and the tv aficionado he was what what's more poetic than having somebody think that the villain on leave it the beaver his goal on stage was to, as he said, put the stake in the heart of the love generation. So he has all of these different things that he brings out, like the snake. His first notable on stage execution was via the electric chair on the Love right. It to Death tour in 71. And then the gallows, Alice is hung, the guillotine. But his most notorious stage prop is the snake. It was. When did this idea begin? And can you tell the story of the one snake Alice had? He had to use it in Brazil. And this thing tried to kill him. Right. Um, so Alice, you know, was, uh, I guess it was a, a, a girl, a, a woman who was hanging around the band who had her own little pet snake, a little snake. And, you know, Alice saw the reaction people were having. She, she took it around like a purse dog, only it was a snake. And Alice saw the reaction. Even he was a little bit afraid at first when you first see the snake. But that, that clicked a light bulb in his head where it was like, okay, there's a reaction there. What can we do with it? Now, Shep Gordon also tells a story about he was in the Middle East and he saw a snake charmer 
and he was watching the reaction of the crowd to the snake as the snake charmer was doing his thing. So I don't know if one of them's telling a story and one of them's telling the truth, or if they both had these experiences and saw it at the, at the same time, but Alice became well-versed in snakeology and how to take care of snakes, especially how to keep them calm. And so that they would be a compliant part of the act. And he had big snakes. I mean, these things, you see them draped over their shoulders. Pictures are in your book. Oh my God. I mean, you know, they're huge. You know, they're absolutely, they're monsters. And so he would use it, you know, on stage and, you know, and he even did it well into, I think the nineties might've been when he stopped using it. Uh, Britney Spears used it as uh, as inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the one you're referring to that, uh, so they go to play a festival in Brazil and you can't bring your own snake into Brazil, I guess. So they said, they told him, don't worry, we'll find one. And Alice is like, well, wait a minute. You know, we, we tame our snakes here. That sounds really dirty. But he <laughs> said, you know, we, uh, because <laughs> most most rock stars as we know do not take yes, their snakes yes um exactly. but you know but but you know saying listen the snake is is part of the cast you know it knows what it's doing but i guess they they promised that they would find him a snake you know a compliant snake and instead they just grabbed one out of the jungle oh. that was ready to kill him and was yes. re- it was a boa that panicked on stage and started to do the boa thing yeah you know oh i love you so much uh, <laughs> I'm and going it, to literally love you to death. Yes. The boas kill you, but with the squeeze. He literally put the squeeze on Elvis and the crew guys had to come out and extricate him. And, you know, the crowd, of course, thinks this is a great part of the act. <laughs> Yay, that's great. Yeah, you know. <laughs> How realistic. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it was freaking realistic. Unreal. So let's. I want to wind down with sure. his comeback in the 80s. And that culminates with the single poison in the summer of 1989 which i still remember that video on mtv and i hadn't i hadn't seen of or heard of alice in so long i remember that i was like wow where has he been but he was around he was just working his way back up to the top and there he is trash the album number 20 goes platinum the power of poison you call it standout moment number 51 in the book alice turned to a much sought after hit maker for this song talk about this song and how it's created yeah, so this was a song co-written by Alice with Desmond Child. And this was, you know, Desmond had already, you know, had hits with Aerosmith and Bon Jovi. He was yes. one of these, he was one of these Kiss, and he was one of these these hired guns that was, you know, brought in to to help turn a either write a hit song or turn a song the band was working on into into a hit. Alice, you know, Alice had already had a couple of album comeback albums out that that were very, very hard rock, almost thrash by design. They wanted to they wanted to bring the ferocious Alice Cooper back. They wanted to bring the Monster Man back and send the message to the world that Alice hasn't lost anything. He's he's still killing. He's still causing mayhem. And they chose music to, that went along with that very heavy, hard, slashy, thrashy type of music but mission accomplished with that it's like okay now let's sell some records again and desmond child was one of the go-to's that they that they went to alice was all for it you know alice had a history of co-writing with michael bruce with the guys in the original band with dick wagner on yeah some there's of a this. name we haven't mentioned dick right. yeah important. dick wagner key figure in alice cooper's career uh, you know, may, may he rest in peace yeah um but, you know, so Al- Alice was a co-writer. Alice was a collaborator for for all of becoming the star of the show. Alice was, you know, Alice was a team player and played nice with others. And in Desmond Child, he, you know, Desmond Child, much like Bob Ezrin, knew, knew, knew a hook, knew how, to, knew how to sculpt a song, knew how to construct and arrange a hit. Two of them sat down, came up with Poison, you know, at the piano. And in, in, I believe it was in a hotel room. And, uh, you know, a very productive session. And, hey, here's a song. Here's a hit. And Alice is back, just like that. Yeah, Yeah. summer of 89. And then Hey Stupid, released in 1991. That's another commercial success. Goes gold, number 47 on Billboard. Feed My Frankenstein is on that album. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then one more in the 90s. 1994 is The Last Temptation. So he continues to tour and record into the 2000s with five albums, I think, between 2000 and 2008. Uh, my favorite, I think, from that era is Brutal Planet, 
2000. Great album. Yeah. There, was a, there was that whole series of, I guess, what we call Alice's socially conscious period, where he was like, he was commenting, you know, on The Last, the last Temptation. Um, his One of his favorite songs is Lost in America. Key line, you know, I, I, want my, I want my mom and dad to be my real mom and dad, talking about the epidemic, if you will, of divorced children, you know, children in broken homes. And uh, so those were... Those are very poignant albums. Yeah. Um, and they I remember the single Gimme from yeah. Brutal Planet. Yeah, I which, you know, obviously a commentary about consumer culture, greed, things like that. No, those were very, those were very smart, very heartfelt albums. A lot of that does come from Alice's own theology. You know, that's yeah. the way he was looking at the world. But these were, these were not ram the Bible down your throat yeah. albums because Al- Alice is not a ram the Bible down your throat guy. By the 2000s, he's he's a legacy artist. I mean, he's right. everybody knows who he is. He's a part. He's still part of pop culture in commercials and movies yeah. and all. And uh, he does bring his guys back from the Alice Cooper band for "Welcome to My Nightmare." Welcome to number two, my right. nightmare. And that was, I believe, what year would that have been? That was 20... 90 or twenty twelve, somewhere around there. Yeah. So. How does that all happen? And he brings back Bob Ezrin too. And right. and it and it's number 22 on Billboard, his highest yeah. charted album since Trash. How did that reunion all come about? Alice has always maintained that they never, there was no rancor in the breakup. I don't know how true that, or if the other guys would quite uh, say it that way, but that they did stay in touch and that they, you know, there was never any attempt to cheat the guys over the years out of what they deserve were, you know, deserved from those record sales and, and any any ancillary income and so that they did stay in touch and certainly when they were inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame and reunited and performed there that was a uh, you know that helped knit them together and so when alice came up with the idea of a uh, of a sequel to welcome to my nightmare and brought ezra and back together the idea was you know what what if we did some of it with the band this time you know because that was the album that they famously split up on let's it's the perfect album to bring it back together. And the original, the surviving original band members, Glenn Buxton had passed away, but the other three have contributed in some way and form to every album since then, right up to Detroit stories in yeah. 21. What did you and think of that album? Welcome to my nightmare. Yeah. The I second thought, one. Welcome to my nightmare. Two? I thought yeah. it was very good. I thought it, you know, it, it got, it had the mojo that, that welcome Two to my nightmare had and had the had a lot of the mojo of the the original Alice Cooper albums, the hit albums, and a lot of that's down to Ezra. And it's it's a nice it's then a nice bonus to hear songs that were conceived and played with the original band. Yeah, and then he had a couple more paranormal Detroit stories, as you mentioned, and that was twenty twenty one. So here we are, seventy five. I think what's great for Alice is. He had never had that kind of voice where he was blowing his voice out. So right. he still sounds great. And as he gets older, it, it actually works. You know, the look he's. Oh, yeah. He he, growled. he has a good growl. His story is great. The comeback story, you know, like you say, he, he was near death, you know, right. and, and he, he pulled himself out of it. He was yeah. near death. His career was near death. And yep. look at him now. He is like you just described a, a heritage artist. He, yep. he can play forever. Yeah. And he can, he can continue to release albums. He's never going to have another billion dollar babies or schools out or love it to death, but he still makes really good albums that people will, will listen to. Yeah. And he's got a fan base too. Solid yeah. fan base. Yep. So Alice Cooper at 75, it's out now through motor books or it's, it's going to be out on the 31st. So that is right. going to be, it's technically still out. It's technically out bookstores. It's okay. Bookstores get the books well before the pub date and if they choose to put it out it's out there so you could even go to your favorite bookstore say is this in the back yet yeah and they'll probably pull it out yeah cool it's cool now what about any websites you want to let people know about or social media i did i don't know if you saw i did friend you and i yeah oh, okay I'll, you i will look I, yes. um you know be, being from the age where when i started journalism we were working with hammer and chisel <laughs> um, my uh my, my social media game occasionally leaves something to be desired it's but, a drag um, though right you gotta they, they say you gotta do it every day you gotta put what oh, am i gonna post every day yeah so there is a gary graph on music facebook yeah uh graph on music on twitter uh, real graph on music on instagram Cool. Yeah, I'll and, put the links up on the show notes page too. So, well, I appreciate that, Gary. This was awesome. Thank you so yeah, much. Wow. Well, listen, thank you so much. You do these, 
you know, much like musicians putting out albums, you do these projects and you, you throw them out there and, you, you know, you hope people find them and experiencing them and you helping to do that. I, I really, really appreciate it. That's it. It's in the books.